Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a Friday afternoon, and we are back in our forefront of future frontiers, the webinar series. We are in series four now. So far, we have completed three series and 18 talks. We started with recent advances across various fields, and then we moved on to the coronavirus, how it has impacted education and healthcare delivery across the country and the world. Then uh, we explored those topics for about four times. Then we moved on to how we are trying to overcome the corona pandemic. Uh, we explored, uh, we had uh, varying uh, talks on that, on how education can be improved or uh, how we can find similarities with public health model and then try and improve it. And we spoke about trials, clinical trials in corona and all that. Then we moved on to uh, the research frontier. We are looking at uh, newer areas and research and how uh, these can make an impact in public health uh, uh, delivery as well as uh, things which are right now on the uh, horizons uh, available only to a few experts to be made available to all routine practitioners and mainstream healthcare. So that is the theme for uh, uh, series four. In this series four, we actually started uh, uh, exploring human genomics. We spoke about personalized medicine. We also spoke about uh, how we can develop uh, repurposed drugs for corona using uh, various mathematical models. So those are the three topics. And we are now moving on to uh, molecular mechanisms, that is uh, the chemical biology of coronavirus and the effect. We have today, Professor uh, uh, Padmesh Bhushan, Dr. Balra. So he will be speaking. So before we move further, I would request our uh, Dean Sir to give the welcome address and uh, introduce the speaker. And for uh, your record, this particular meeting is live streamed in YouTube live. We are also recording this meeting. I would request all participants to keep their mics muted so that the audio quality is good for everybody. And uh, we would request you at least for some time to keep your videos on so that we would be able to see who, who it is and all that. Okay, with these few announcements, I pass on the, to Professor P.F. Kotur, our Dean, for welcoming the uh, guest. Over to you, sir. Yeah, uh, very good afternoon to Padma Bhushan, Professor Dr. Balram and all the esteemed participants. As a head of the institution, I feel really privileged welcome you all for this webinar series number 19 in the line and uh, i welcome all our esteemed speaker and uh, all the participants on behalf of our management on behalf of our honorable chancellor and the board of management vice chancellor and uh, the other higher officials and uh, i must uh, at this point of time share a few thoughts about uh, when we the global health crisis started in the month of February when we were all confined to four walls. The scientific society of uh, uh, our medical college, AVMC, Arkadavidu Medical College, thought of con conceived the idea of establishing this platform wherein we can be we can invite the the uh, focus scholars, scientists, teachers on the platform and uh, created to share their expertise with all the participants for the better or benefit of all the medical fraternity. And our, our, it has become I, almost uh, it has become very popular and it is 19th uninterrupted one. And it has become the tradition of AEMC. And we have the participants from various medical colleges across the country and one of places. And we had uh, the uh, three or four speakers from different continent, Australian continent, American continent, Singapore, etc. And today it's a special thing for us. We have a wonderful uh, uh, a person to top up with that. And I'm going to come to that uh, later. And uh, during this time of uh, global health crisis, we may be, the mankind ever faced, our life or lifestyle, everything get destroyed, devastated, and disturbed. And under such a condition, you know, See, we have to we have now we have start initial euphoria in India of not getting affected, not having many deaths when people were dying like uh, uh, in, uh, like mosquitoes, you know, 
in uh, developed countries we are very happy and uh, we are all claiming that uh, our uh, indian gene is uh, resistant we have got a herd immunity all kinds of other things but now i think the real government situation has come now we are racing for top position as number of infections also as number of uh, the deaths you know it's quite amazing and quite frightening and uh, you know we never know what is so much unpredictable we are under such circumstances such educative programs such thing you know will certainly bring us uh, to bring us uh, bring us life into us restore us a uh, revive us you know is this is a, a wonderful thing this is how we are here in the and half of our uh, programs are one way or the related to this covid pandemic and i was very happy when uh, i requested professor balram about uh, almost uh, he, he will be the one who will be talking the root cause root of things which and i am sure you know uh, he will make us to understand the what exactly it has happened or has been happening with these uh, few remarks i have the privilege of introducing our uh, respected professor balram to you all he is well known uh, it needs no introduction if you ask me and uh, uh, yeah and he, this is the educational journey of uh, professor uh, balram starting from ferguson college pune to the harvard university you know he is associate iit kanpur then uh, carnegie mellon prestigious university then he had a post doctoral stint uh, under the nobel laureate that is in harvard university you know the nobel laureate you know uh, woodward you know who is known for it was even during that time the 1940s era was known as woodward in era very lot many natural uh, occurring substances natural occurring uh, things were being synthesized you know he had mastered the art of synthesizing these uh, uh, many complex things including vitamin b12 most complex person under such an eminent person professor balra he did his post doctoral fellowship and probably he got refined that time and uh, wonderful after that there is no looking back and he came and uh, uh, spent his next almost four decades of his life he has been now also he is there in uh, indian institute of science what if he has more than 40 years as a faculty then uh, uh, more than a decade about as a uh, director Man, of that and now he is a professor emeritus in the uh, department of geophysics and uh, and uh, now he is also associated with the uh, center for division of biological science which is a branch of uh, atta institute of fundamental research and he is a molecular biophysics unit in uh, i i see quite a wide now also his main areas of interest many of you know uh, next one all the next one next slide yeah the main area of interest are the investigation of the structure and conformity of the biological activity of the designed and natural peptides you know? and uh, his disciplines you know you will of interest marine biology structural biology bioinformatics biochemistry medicinal chemistry organic chemistry and he has a skill and he developed expertise in protein engineering and uh, this uh, bioanalytical spectrometry nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy infrared spectroscopy circular dichroism and along with x-ray crystallography so even difficult for us to understand you or pronounce and uh, his scientific publications has been more than 600 and cite citations more than 18000 and this you know some of us we use that uh, rg score of uh, research year score of 49.05 is higher than 98.5% of all these researchers enrolled on research kit and uh, he has the current science current science is a journal which i always equate with the uh, new england journal of medicine or uh, or uh, lancet of india you know he established in the year 1932 and uh, he was the editor for that journal for quite long and his editorials during that time uh, were wonderful i was looking forward to read them such thought over uh, i can say penetrative uh, thought provoking the editorials you know you know uh, again i request all the participants you know they are available on the net you can uh, see that and uh, i was very indeed fortunate to have had an opportunity of uh, 
meeting him, interacting him when I was working in Polar. And at this point of time, I also must not forget acknowledging uh, another scientist of eminence, Dr. P. R. Krishnasamy, who happens to be Professor Balram's good friend, who had created the opportunity for me to go nearer to Professor Balram and interact. And every interaction with him has been a new experience for me, new learning experience for me. And over and above all this, in spite of his accomplishments, in spite of his honors, Dr. Balram is a modest man. You know? so the, the ego, those kind of privacy, we all are absent, down to earth. And he's a, he's a wonderful human being. This is what I can tell. And I must, at this point of time, feel privileged that the EMC had opportunity of uh, uh, inviting him. And it was good of him, grace of him, to have invited, he accepted our invitation for this uh, webinar and now I think uh, I don't want to be more in between you and all of you are very eager to listen to Professor uh, Balram. Uh, thank you one and all. Over to you uh, Professor Balram sir. Participants to kindly mute themselves please. Thank you. Sir, your screen is visible, sir. Sir, mic is of Dr. Balram. Professor Balram is switched off. Hello. So, mic is on. We are in getting the audio, sir. Yes. Yeah, you can go ahead. Sir. I think when I went to yeah, share, yeah, yeah, yeah. you can hear me. Okay. Let's see. Hello, we can hear you, sir. We can hear you, sir. It is showing that you have started to share content. Um, I just spoke to. Yeah. Yeah. Full screen? No. Not yet. Ah, yes. Ah, yeah. Done. You can hear me all. Oh, yes, wonderful. Ah. Yeah. You're good so, to know, sir. I'm very happy to be able to speak to you this afternoon. Yeah. Professor Kotur for He did. Oh, no, no, no. Speak on the coronavirus. And I must confess that I'm not a I'm going to tell you what I have learned about the coronavirus. I'm going to tell you a little bit of history and a little bit of chemical biology. I'm going to tell you how the virus was discovered, the components of the virus. And to discuss a little bit of what we know about how the virus enters our cells. You're all predominantly a clinical audience. I'm not going to discuss how the virus is infected, how does the immune system react to infection by the virus, and this must be the subject of a more elaborate discussion. But the coronavirus is a public health nightmare, but it's also an artist's delight. You can look at all the kind of visualizations of the coronavirus that are available even more. And one definite virus which I may come back to, all viruses in fact, is that they can be called a piece of bad news wrapped up in a protein. And I will tell you who said this, what is the reason finding a virus in this fashion. 
census showed the public imagination across the world. Uh, when the pandemic first started, I found all these pictures coming from Alabama, from Chennai, uh, uh, very imaginative for policemen, <laughs> for auto drivers, all of them depicting coronavirus. In France and Italy, although the coronavirus businesses, very quickly they recovered to make Easter eggs out of the coronavirus. There was a corona cake produced in Italy. And so people really now have come to understand what the coronavirus might, might have. Describing what I think of the coronavirus, we need to recognize that in understanding nature, nature that is human beings and the diseases which afflict them. But if you understand nature in its grandest sense, then you need both chemistry and biology. Now, I have big pillars for chemistry and biology. For chemistry, I picked Mendeleev's periodic table, which gives us all the elements and arranges them in a certain order. This is one of the greatest triumphs, really, of the 19th and 20th centuries to completely understand the elements in complete detail, to understand the structure of atoms. Biology is held up, really, by one major pillar, and that is Darwin's ideas of natural selection and evolution. And it is very important, Darwin, Darwin because in understanding the pandemic, we might really need to understand something about viruses, how they evolve, how they come to terms with their environment, and what will be the eventual outcome of humanity with the coronavirus. Chemistry is most important in understanding biology. And nobody has said this better than the point. He said he's writing to you. Yeah. 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 I think he said even the is playing some mystery. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what did he say, Mr. Whatever. Teacher, I didn't know because Marcy wished to the same gang. Told him, please stop logic surgery, not to cancel not to cancel our chat. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. I have uh, exp I have she muted this participant. Yeah. Sorry, sir, yeah. Uh, microphones were muted because I hear them otherwise. Uh, actually, when you're speaking at live audience, somebody can stand up and ask you a question. A lot of people in a virtual audience, you don't know who is saying anything. And this is one difficulty. Uh, Arthur Conberg, one of the most influential biochemists of the 20th century, put this wonderful an article he called chemistry the lingua franca of the medical and biological sciences. So if medical professionals are to appreciate their discipline and to appreciate the biology of the human being, then of course it's very important that they understand chemistry. And this is why I titled my talk as the chemical biology of the coronavirus. Central understanding chemistry is the importance of atoms and molecules. I've gone back here to physics. These are Feynman lectures in physics. And in the very first chapter of the Feynman lectures, he will make this statement, matter is made up of atoms. Then in teaching undergraduate students at Caltech, and remember, if you want to go for a medical degree, you have to first go through a graduate degree a full four-year program, taking whatever courses you would like. Question. If in some cataclysm, all of scientific knowledge is destroyed, and only one sentence passed on to the next generation of creatures, what statement would contain the most information in the fewest work? He answers his question. He says, I believe it is the atomic hypothesis or fact, or whatever you wish to call it, that all things are made up of atoms 
little particles that move around in perpetual motion, attracting each other when they are a little distance apart, but repelling upon being squeezed into one another. This is a it's a wonderful way of describing the atomic hypothesis. It tells you many things about forces between atoms and about the constant motion of atoms in molecules. Everything that we discuss is made up of atoms. All of us are made up of atoms. All the chemical and in fact, in nature, which is not made up of atoms. And therefore, there is no escaping the atomic hypothesis. There is no escaping from chemistry. But let's go. Viruses, for example, exist in the sea. They exist wherever life is. And in fact, it turns out little attention has been to the large viral diversity there in the oceans. But viruses can move between the terrestrial reservoirs. And this, of course, raises the specter of emerging pathogens. In 2020 has really reminded us that we must pay attention to our environment and we must pay attention to the dynamics of biology which exists in our environment. Extraordinarily large virus characterized in the ocean. They are called viruses or mini viruses. For example, the mini virus has 979 proteins. The mega virus has 1,120 proteins. The coronavirus, by comparison, is a very small virus, and I'm going to tell you about the coronavirus. But if you just nature, you will find some statistics of marine viruses which are quite remarkable. It now estimated that the oceans contain 4 into 10 raised to 30 viruses. In Puducherry, the ocean is just a stone's throw away from you. And you might ask how many viruses are there in the ocean and when are they going to come to land? Or are they going to come through marine organisms which people eat and will they eventually become a part of the human ecosystem also? This is something that you must really think about. And the numbers that are there are the kind that physicists like to think about. You know, if one stretch end, they would span 10 million light years. This is a wonderful statement. What's the mass that they have? All that is discussed in this paper, but I will not uh, elaborate more on this. One question which is of do viruses belong to chemistry or do they belong to biology? Biology deals with living organisms. Chemistry deals with uh, everything else which is non-living. All chemicals which are non-living are part of the tree of life. And you will find that there are arguments in the literature even today. Ten reasons exclude viruses from the tree of life. Bacteria, archaea, all the eukaryotic organisms of which human beings are a part, form the three kingdoms of life, the three branches of the tree of life. But it's all that viruses exchange across the super kingdoms of life, between eukaryotes and between bacteria. If you can exchange genes with genes in these three kingdoms, then you can see eventually viruses become part of our genomes. We are, in fact, to some extent, creatures of all the viruses which we have encountered during the of evolution. Here is the definition of a virus. Taken from a philosophical dictionary of biology entitled Aristotle to Zeus. And this was written by one of the most important of the 20th century, Peter Medeva, and also one of the most effective scientists who said, that inasmuch as viruses are made only known, only by their causing disease or other pathological changes, the existence of benign viruses having no ill effects remains conjectural. No viruses good. And then 
he says, quoting an anonymous source, it has been well said that a virus is a piece of bad news wrapped up in a problem. And we are going to see what the problem is. In understanding chemistry biology, it's very important to understand scales of length and scales of time and scales of energy. A length scale and uh, a time scale here taken from the internet. You can see where viruses are bigger than the ribosome, they are smaller than mitochondria. They lie somewhere in between. We are going to see what is the size of the virus. They are certainly much better, bigger than individual molecules like hemoglobin, which is a fairly large molecule, which all of you are familiar with. But the coronavirus itself is what is called an antivirus. I show you the most common image of the coronavirus on the left. And on the right, I show you a picture of the coronavirus, a part of the coronavirus, which I'm going to talk about in some detail. You can see there's a spiky projection which protrudes from the surface. This is the spike protein. You can see a blue structure. That's another protein. You can see purple balls inside. Those are other proteins. And then if you look very carefully, you will see a little yellow. You will see a little yellow and then another little yellow ball, and these two are spaced apart. In between them, there are hydrocarbon chains. That is the phospholipid bilayer of membranes. When it started, we were told to wash our hands repeatedly with soap and water. The reason you're asked to wash your hands with soap and water is that detergents break up the bilayer membrane of the coronavirus, and the virus then disintegrates. And, but clinicians should know this very well, because one of the high priests of medical education, William Oster, said this a long time ago. He said soap and water and common sense are the best disinfectants. So washing your hands with soap and, of course, no most important. This is the course of the corona, which now shows us what the surface of the virus looks like, because the surface is very important because we recognize all objects by their surfaces. We recognize one another by what we look like on the outside, not what we look like on the inside. Similarly, if the virus is to be recognized by our immune system, it is going to be recognized by really by what is on the surface. That would be the first response. In order to be, for it to be recognized by more elaborate responses, the virus will have to be broken down and then presented. I'm going to go back to something and here something personal. In the month of March, when we went into the first lockdown, it was the first experience that I had of being completely at home, unable to go out to the computer and the telephone for communication. I had to read at that time about the coronavirus. And the first thing that I asked myself, because I'm interested in the history of science, I asked myself the question, who are the authors of the coronavirus? And so I began to read the literature. One of the first papers that reports a picture of the coronavirus obtained by electron microscopy is this paper by Almeida and Terrell, which appeared a long time ago in the mid-1960s, in 1967 to be precise. I have pictured the two authors here, David Terrell and June Almeida. I then say interesting finding from these experiments was that two human respiratory viruses, 229E and B814, are morphologically identical in this virus. And then they did the virus 29E. What had they done? They had isolated the virus and characterized it under the electron microscope. And in the middle, let you see here, between the images of Terran and Amida, you can see the coronavirus. You can see the spiky projections. You can see what we see 50 years later in beautiful color with computer graphics enhancing the images that we see. They go on in this paper, and I read this paper, and these are all causing infections. These were all clinicians and they were doing research. 
And so it's very important to understand what they were doing. They were isolating viruses from people who had upper respiratory tract infections. And they studied the 229E virus. But they call it the 229E virus of So I went back and asked myself the question, who was hungry? I found in the article to this paper, they Dr. D. Hungry for supplying the 229E virus. So I decided that Dr. D. Hungry must be the discoverer of the 229E coronavirus. And that's the sample which has given rise to the picture that we all now celebrate. I then went back to Google and put in the name Dorothy Hambre because I found her first name by that time, found that she was a woman, and then I found in Google papers. Uh, all the papers, you find, you don't find anything else on Google. Now even find my picture. And this is what puzzled me. If somebody like me can be pictured on Google, why is Dorothy Hamre now missing? I Google Scholar searches, online searches, and then established a profile. It was a profile of a productive scientist beginning in bacteriology in 1941, transitioning to virology, and with a publishing career spanning the period 1941 to 1972. Yet no photograph was found on Google Images, and so I asked myself the question, who was Dorothy Hathaway? I found that she'd written a book, and she'd written a book on writing in 1968. And then I found that after 1971, she had simply disappeared. I then found that she had disappeared by doing more research on the internet archives in Arizona, which contained her name. And then I communicated with the archives in Arizona and found that what the archives contained were photographs that she had taken of the wonderful natural beauty of the South United States. I also found that she had served as a research associate at the Squibb Institute, and then I really found I tracked Dorothy Hanway. In the of the lockdown, People at the Arizona archives are very kind. They went and opened their archives and searched for what had been deposited. And then they found there were photographs that they had never looked at. And then I found Dorothy Hamre. And by then I had found Dorothy Hamre in other places, which the at the Squibb Institute, there's a picture which is on the top right. You see amongst a whole lot of men. And this was the situation in the United States in the 1940s and the early 1950s. This picture is dated 1950. Central to this picture, because she was one of the first persons to introduce an antiviral drug into the literature. Yet she went unrecognized and she retired, she left rather, the University of Chicago and went away to settle down in the Colorado Yockey area, where she is pictured here. She was less than 60 years old, and uh, she had already discovered the causes of cancer and was explaining them to people in Chicago, but she had only the designation of research associate. She was never on the faculty. So I've now remade my slide to the discoverers of the coronavirus. published. It is being discussed even in, uh, in American discussions, and uh, Henry now is a central figure in the early history of the coronavirus. This is what we know. I want you to show the which I read, which took me, made me to all of this. 1966, paper, she found that the strain 229E is the first coronavirus demonstrated as a human pathogen. She got this from students who had infection. She also did some wonderful experiments. She showed that this virus multiplication in the culture systems that she had at that time was inhibited by 5-fluorodeoxyuridine. 5-fluorodeoxyuridine 
is a compound that clinicians use in cancer chemotherapy even today. What they showed was that this was ribose, which did not have DNA, but this, the nucleic acid of the viruses, is ribose acid RNA. She also was an expert experimentalist with viruses, and she would filter viruses, and she established the site of the virus Today, I would say it is 89 nanometers because the units have changed. I was really inspired when I read these papers, but I then found also a 2018 paper, Case Reports in Infectious Diseases, which was brought to my attention by a popular article in the American press. In this, Greek clinicians have described a case of a patient with acute respiratory distress syndrome having all the symptoms of COVID-19, but was actually COVID positive, but was positive for E. And this is where coronaviruses have vastly different uh, effects on different human, on different patients. It is now we can look this. They have also estimated the average diameter between 800 and 1200 angstrom, that is between 80 and 120 nanometers. You can see the units are changing. In 1968, the coronavirus as a new group of viruses with an informal letter. To this is the first time that the term coronavirus appeared in the scientific literature. They were named 75 a formal naming in a journal called Intervirology by the associations of virologists. By this time, you can see that Dorothy Hambre's name has disappeared from the list of authors. When David Terrell summarized literature, and he was a leading figure in this, and I'm going to come back to him. When David Terrell summarized the United States, this is what he wrote about coronaviruses. They cause mild upper respiratory infection, common cold, they are of two serotypes, and the appearance of antibodies in and nasal secretion is followed by resolution of the infection. Immunity wanes within a year or two. Today, when you see all the bewildering literature on uh, COVID-19, you see that it is very important to do the kind of experiments which were done in the 1960s and the 1970s, and do very carefully. tried all the work that he did, which appeared at the beginning of the 21st century, Cold Wars. He's not talking about the Cold War between Russia and the Western world. He's talking about the war between human beings and the common cold. This was a unit called the Common Cold Unit set up in England immediately after the Second World War. This was done because the greatest loss of productivity in industry was by people reporting with colds. So there was a lot of interest in trying to find a cold and to find therapeutics for cold, which had been given up because Tyrell's work established that the rhinoviruses are a very diverse class of viruses, so vaccines are not possible. We still don't know whether a vaccine is possible for the uh, coronavirus of 2018. What did they do? They took extracts from nasal, nasal secretions from people with colds and tried to grow these in cultures. They used animal tissue to grow these. And they had this wonderful unit which has not been closed down uh, called the Common Cold Research Unit. They would ask for volunteers to come. All expenses paid 10 days free holiday in a wonderful place. What do you have to do? You have to get yourself uh, they will take nasal secretions from people who have cold and then infect other people in the nose with those secretions. And then they say it is true that there is a one in three risk of catching a cold, but in a very good cause. Secretions are usually minor and brief. This is the kind of clinical research which was done to identify the coronavirus. I want all of you who are listening to this lecture to ask, could this kind of clinical research not have been done in India at some point in time or the other? Or can we not do it even now when we see so many viral infections which come along? But 
the virus that all of you are interested in appeared in 2020 really the first patients of our and everything that i have on the slide is from the first article that was published received by nature in on january 7 2020 went online immediately and was published online in february 3rd 2020. you can see what they and you can see their worry is here about how the coronavirus uh, might have spread from the animal live animal markets of wuhan up to human beings but the viral genome was completely characterized in this paper it contains 29903 nucleotides this is the chemistry we now know exactly how many atoms there are in the viral genome because we have sequence we need to understand the virus in all detail and that's what scientists all over the world have been doing why is this necessary i just show you why it's necessary because we consider the virus and if we consider the, as the virus as an enemy and we need to overcome the enemy, we must follow this dictum from a very famous movie, The Godfather. The second version of The Godfather which came along, uh, Michael Corleone says this, Al Pacino acting as Michael Corleone says, keep friends close, but your enemies close. There are two areas in which this in many if pathogens are your enemies, make friends with your pathogens and learn them well. In politics also sometimes, if you know who they are, you must sometimes keep, keep them very, very good call. Now suppose we, you know, can we now estimate the size of the particle? Can we estimate what that sphere, what is its size? How big is our enemy? As back in 1975, people in the area of biophysics were already drawing graphs like this. They look at the molecular weight of the nucleic acid and the dry molecular weight of the particle itself. These are known for a lot of viruses. Those which would interest you are the herpes virus and the pox virus, both of which are shown here. Today, there are other methods by which we can estimate the size of the virus. But the virus is a very large particle for chemistry. It really straddles the border in chemistry and biology. In 2006, we had already had, I'm going to come to this in a moment. We already had SARS-CoV-1, which came in 2002, 2003, killed a lot of people, but it disappeared. So nobody bought Scientists working in the area of virology continue to work with SARS-CoV-1, which is very similar to SARS-CoV-2. And so they have pictures, they have very detailed electron microscopy, now more sophisticated electron microscopy, electron cryomicroscopy, for which a Nobel Prize was given a short while ago. And you can see now, you can image particles much better. The mean particle diameter here is 82 to Dorothy Hamre's estimation in 1966 was 89 nanometers. Could you have done better? My answer is no. So we must pay a tribute to those biologists from the 60s and the 70s who actually characterized the coronavirus. The fact that we didn't see this infection meant that we did not take it seriously enough at the beginning of the 21st century. But is the emergence of the coronavirus we know a great deal about it, and I'm going to come back to you, all the components of the coronavirus. But the SARS outbreak of 2003 is it's now to read that on the 28th of February 2003, a patient was reported in Hanoi, small hospital, patient had very unusual symptoms, some remarkable uh, clinician there recognized that they'd never seen anything like this before, and they called the WHO. The WHO immediately sent one of their specialists, Dr. Carlo Urbani, to that site. He immediately realized that this was an infection, which was a new infection. It is this kind of recognition that is very important in fighting disease. And he did not survive very long because he got infected. On March 11th, he began to have symptoms. He flew to Bangkok. He told a colleague from the Center for Disease Control 
not to come anywhere near him. They had protective gear. He fought for the next 18 days and he died on the 29th of March 2000. 17 years later in India, we had the first of our major lockdowns at this time. I had then the Department of Biotechnology that at least they should do something to recognize Dr. Urbani, who had died in March and it was his anniversary, and we should now uh, honor him. But of course, we did not. The, we need uh, clinicians who are able to recognize infection when they see it. And then you need biologists who are then able to track the viruses down. To his work, we understand SARS CoV 2, understood SARS CoV 1. CoV 2 is a repetition of what was in one. Not improved very much in the last years, maybe a little bit. Same techniques. So this is the it has a very important spike glycoprotein. These are the four important proteins in coronaviruses. The spike protein, which I'm going to describe, is it binds to the receptor and it in, involved in membrane fusion. In recognition by the target cell and in fusing with the target cell, the spike protein is very important. There are other proteins which hold the virus together, the membrane protein, the envelope protein, and the nuclear capsid protein which covers the ribonucleic acid inside. So the picture of the coronavirus that emerges is it is a spherical particle with spiky projections and a very tightly packed interior. Biophysics and ask the question, if you have 100 nanometer spherical particle, what would be its internal volume? How much is in the uh, coronavirus? What is the cause of the coronavirus? These are things I think that people are really uh, worrying about today. Uh, but I would estimate the dry molecular weight of the coronavirus as about 500 million Daltons. For those of you to whom this figure makes no sense, so inside the cell, which is the machine which makes proteins, has a molecular weight of about 2 million Daltons. So this would now be about 250 times more complex than the ribosome. The only connection between us and the ribosome is that Venki Ramakrishnan, who got the Nobel Prize for determining the structure of the ribosome, who is also originally, if you trace his origins back, is from the state of Tamil Nadu. Uh, Krishnan uh, uh, determined the structure of this monstrous structure of two million dolphins. Now, if you want to get the virus in atomic detail, you have a 250 million times uh, that problem. 50 times that problem. Let's go back to the protein. Protein. It's a glycosylated protein. It's a very large protein. Anywhere in length between 1100 and 1400 amino acid residues. And you will all recall that proteins are polymers made up of amino acids. Each amino acid might have a mass of about 110 Daltons. But if you put many of them together, the polymer will have a very large mass. It's a trimeric structure. It's a trimeric structure in which the three protein chains wind around one another. You can see the trimeric structure on the left. You can see a bulb or stalk and a heptad repeat of sequence which allows the trimer to form. This is the structural biology of the spike protein of the coronavirus. But the cell biology that happens afterwards is that a host protease must cleave this protein after it has fused. And this is very, very important in the mechanism. Why are mechanisms important? Mechanisms are important because only if you understand mechanisms can. And when you interfere with mechanisms, you need understanding of the mechanism. When everyone asks for drugs, can appear by two. One by accident, like Alexander Fleming's penicillin. The other by design, by some research. And this is part of one of the director. It is understand these things. Lecture come out. This is also now. And I show you a picture. The end of the structure is. 
Uh, the protein which binds the genome, the RNA genome, is also a very large protein. That also is reasonably well established now. And how it binds to the nucleic acid, all this is known. But this, eventually what it will give you is an entire picture of all the components of the coronavirus. But we can ask another question. How does the virus fuse with the target cell? For example, if the virus is to go to the lung, it must in fact bind to and enter some epithelial cell uh, in lung tissue. This is understood well by all the work that has been done on the influenza virus. All this work has been done by structural biologists who determine the structures of the virus and cell biologists who then study more detailed mechanisms. In fact, one of the things that the term structural biology has done, it has integrated two fields of biomedical research, immunology on the one hand and virology. And when we keep talking about vaccines, we must there's a strong connection between virology and immunology. But when we begin to end together, chemistry tells you that they will repel. That is the picture that I've shown you below. This is a picture that you will find in basic chemistry when you bring two molecules together. They will slowly begin to, if you want them to join together, you must go climb a hill and then come down. And all this, all these chemical processes have to happen. And these have now been understood quite well. There is every likelihood that the people who have understood the mechanism cell future will one day be recognized with the Nobel Prize and you will see their pictures in the newspapers. But if you look at a cell biology textbook or a virology textbook, you will find uh, pictures of virus cell future. And I hope that clinic students who are preparing for medical degrees will have at some point or the other the incentive to look at virology and immunology textbooks. This is a matter of detail. What is the actual mechanism of pollution? Now I can come back to an even more chemical question. Is the atomic level structure of the now available? And the answer is yes, it is available. It was available of coronavirus 1. It is available for COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. So the SARS-CoV-2 structure now is understood in atomic detail. I show you on the left a picture which is arrived at. It is just a schematic picture, but this is a picture in which the membrane is not there, and we've taken only the portion which protrudes out. This is the spiky protein. It, the receptor is going to recognize this. It is going to recognize it from the top. If an antibody is going to bind this in a vaccine, it is going to recognize it from the top. One is to understand the structure to make both therapeutics and vaccines. I have now only two components of what is a component which contains three molecules. Uh, how atoms are there in these molecules and how they are moving with respect to one another. It's a tribute to physics that we are able to actually see these structures. It's also a tribute to computer science. The protein molecule. And what you're seeing now is the general structure of the polymeric protein. It's a strip generally taken up and folded into this uh, three dimensional structure. You can clearly recognize that there are different things. Just as you can recognize heads, tail, legs, hands, and everything, you can recognize there's a head there, there's yet another domain. I have colored them up here to show that there are different anatomical parts. Protein structures are looked at just the way medical students uh, look at the human. One of the reviews, advances in protein chemistry, which came three decades ago, was entitled 
the anatomy and taxonomy of pro protein structures. Anatomy is from medicine, taxonomy is from biology. And we have all kinds of protein structures and we need to classify them in terms of the. They are like machines which must be understood. And therefore, biologists need to understand protein machines in much the same way that engineers understand a mechanical machine. What is the receptor for the coronavirus spike protein? It is the very first receptor, 1992, you can see. There were already two coronaviruses at that time. In 1992, we're looking at 229E. This is Dorothy Hamrey's 229E. And they discovered that aminopeptidase N, a protease, which is on the surface of the cell, which has multifunctional roles in uh, physiological processes. This is the one which recognizes the coronavirus. They also discover many years of research, uh, 2012, they realized different coronaviruses, those which infect dogs, those which infect, those which contain are to different parts of the uh, protein itself. You may see me waving my hands because I've had an interruption in my own house because somebody is at the front door and I cannot go now and open the door. The is a function of the SARS coronavirus. This is SARS CoV 1, it is also SARS CoV 2. And it's now a metallopeptidase. It's just like aminopeptidase N. It is also a protease and it is on the surface of the cell. Now, what it turns out is that cells have many proteases because breaking up peptide bonds is very important in physiology. The virus is an opportunity, I would call it a creature. And the virus now uses anything it can bind to to get into the cell. So sometimes it binds to amino acid. This one binds to angiotensin converting enzyme too. And tomorrow we may find that there's another virus which binds to yet another receptor. Angiotensin is a, many of you will know because both vasoconstriction and vasodilation are important. Uh, blood pressure control is important. And therefore, the angiotensin 1, angiotensin 2 converting enzyme has been a drug target and is inhibited by captopril. Captopril is still in use. And uh, angiotensin 2 is now converted further by angiotensin converting enzyme 2. And it is this enzyme, which I have now shown on the arrow in red, that is the enzyme which is the receptor for the coronavirus. But only of one domain of the coronavirus, but a structure is now available of the receptor molecule that is angiotensin converting to binding to this. We know this in atomic detail, so we know how these two molecules are recognizing one another. This is a more elaborate picture. What you would now like to do is to prevent us from recognizing one another. How can you do this by making a decoy? A decoy would be any molecule which will recognize the coronavirus before the target cell. All kinds of research is going on in the current literature in creating such molecules. Some of them are proteins, some of them are antibodies, some of them would eventually turn out to be maybe even smaller molecules. We do not know what will happen in the long run. This is a recognition. You need to interfere with recognition. But there are so many viruses you can which infect animals. They all bind to the same receptor, but at different places. So the virus now is a marvel of evolution. It finds one. Another factor is both coronavirus receptors are zinc metalloproteases, which have the same kind of active site. But that seems to have nothing to do with their recognition abilities. But I found this curious. And uh, what is very interesting is, and here I must digress, I have 
infected with COVID-19. I have gone through the full 10 days of hospitalization and 14 days of quarantine. I have read more when I have been in these uh, kinds of situations. And it's sort of interesting that one of the things that clinicians seem to give you and recommend to you are vitamins which have a lot of zinc. And uh, one doesn't really know what the connection is between the zinc that we ingest and the fact that the coronavirus itself seems to like zinc. But breaking down what virus receptors proteases, because proteases and peptide processing is ubiquitous in biology. Proteins as a source of biologically active peptides is one mechanism by which make hormones. In the brain itself, in your brains and in mine, pro protein, which is the product of a single gene. But from the product of a single gene, proteases chop this into smaller molecules. Melanotropin, alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone, corticotropin or the adrenocorticotropic hormone, beta melanocyte hormone, and beta endorphin, which is important in pain perception, and from it the encephalates. All of these is now uh, uh, all of these arise from one protein molecule. So proteins is very important, and that's why we have so many proteases. I I think no to me because once I declined the request, my uh, Slides no longer move forward. Uh, I take to stopping sharing uh, and starting sharing again. Yeah, yes, here yes, in the uh, melanocotton slide. Hmm. Oh, wonderful. Later on, molecules which are post translational multiplications in the N and the C minus so that they can't be broken further. They have a long half life in circulation and go, can go from one part of the body to the other. So more peptide hormones are produced in one gland, but a target or cell is somewhere else. So we are under but this structure determination has moved further. Already you can see in 2020, we have structure now of the entire receptor molecule bound now. This is the structure of the entire molecule, the human angiotensin converting enzyme 2, now bound to the coronavirus receptor binding domain. So all these details are now available. And these details which will help us to understand, once again, mechanisms of infection, they don't yet help us to understand but I think this will be done. But they also now allow us to think about target therapeutic vaccine design. And uh, all your vaccine killed virus vaccine, they will be a vaccine against the spike protein, which is at the very top of the Instead of the receptor catching the spike, the vaccine will now generate uh, antibodies which will capture the spike protein. Now we can ask how much more detail can we have about the coronavirus? Because I promised that I would talk about the chemical biology of the coronavirus. And what I'm talking about is our ignorance of the chemical biology of the coronavirus, really. We are only getting there. The coronavirus now has 16 proteins in one part of the genome, and the rest of the genome codes for another four or five. 
maybe all put together 20, 25 proteins. That's the total size of all the molecules which will be there. I have taken this from a New York Times article. This is because there's no better picture of this available in the scientific literature. The wonderful article which appeared as early as April 3rd. And here they have shown the pictures of what each protein would look like. But I don't ask the pictures of the proteins. All of these put together will now give you an object. And it is understanding that object in detail, which will be the purpose of all which future clinical advances will be based. What are these? One is called a cellular saboteur. Another one is a mystery protein. One, the one for in cutting, scissors, bubble maker, bubble factory, copy assistants at the heart of the cell. Why is this needed? Think about it for a minute. Anybody can think about this. Once the virus has gone into the cell, it's broken down. Only the RNA is released. That RNA now replicates. And then it is translated and protein structures are made. Then all of these are put back to make protein molecules, uh, many viruses. So many virus particles emerge from every, every infected cell. This is a marvelous biological phenomenon. How do we get viruses to make copies of themselves? Well, with that limited RNA information, they use the machinery of your cells along with the machinery that they have. And these are the components of the machine. When you see the word cellular saboteur, mystery protein, what are clinicians worrying about? They are reporting more and more diverse symptoms of patients. The larger the number of patients, the greater the diversity of the symptoms that are reported. And uh, the result of all of that is viruses, which is causing many, many problems for the hosts which it has infected. What are those problems? We would have understood those problems much better if we had also paid attention to what I would call veterinary virology. But in most places, veterinary is on one pedestal lower uh, than uh, medical practitioners and medical research. The result of this is we have not understood many, many things. Look at uh, escape artist, signal walker, virus liberator, mystery protein, cleaning up, more camouflage. Does it do to the host cell? It certainly leaves host tissue far more damaged than what it was. And maybe tissue which has been damaged in many, many parts, which we are not going to take, which we are exactly much later when patients start coming back again with one complaint or the other. Having myself and having, and having had my entire family as patients, I have seen the diversity of symptoms. I've also seen the diversity of symptoms reported in the lip. And I thought by emphasizing the quality of the coronavirus's chemical biology, I will try and catalyze thinking on the part of freshly entering students into on how much attention they should pay to the basic sciences if they want that they are undertaking. Thank you very much. I would only like to acknowledge the two institutions in which I have spent my career, the Indian Institute of Science on the top left, where I was there for almost four decades, and more recently in my post I have been sheltered at the National Center for Biological Sciences. Both institutions have provided me with an opportunity to think about whatever I like, to read about whatever I like, to speak about whatever I like. And uh, I think this kind of privilege is given to very few. And I hope that many of you who are entering the medical profession, who are students, I hope all of you will at some time or the other have the opportunity to such wonderful places. Thank you very much.
Uh, I can't hear you. Hello? Ah, I can hear you now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I would like to thank you very much on behalf of the audience and the Scientific Society of Lake Institute for a very informative talk which seamlessly moved across various boundaries from uh, uh, artist delights of coronavirus to uh, quoting Godfather to uh, quoting literatures across this. And the history of the virus was presented in a very nice way. Like uh, when you spoke about the unsung warriors in the history of uh, coronavirus discovery, it was really moving. Uh, and I hope that uh, we had quite a few students in the audience and they get motivated by such things and uh, take up uh, research in a much better fashion in the future. Now I have for you some questions from the audience chat window as well as at the time of registration. So the first and uh, I'd like to put this from Dr. Kiran from Devrajur's uh, University, Kolar. Uh, they found that uh, she has got a question that when we see the medical reports worldwide, some people are COVID positive, but not symptomatic and healthy, but some are uh, suffered really seriously and they have died. So she wants to know another thing is RBD or S1 subunit of spike protein undergoes mutation. So the question is, is there any particular mutated virus which is causing serious health problems? That is what is the question. You know, in the literature, there's been some discussion of one specific mutant in the receptor binding domain, which they claim is more infectious. And a paper has also appeared in a very good journal. But there is no compelling evidence uh, to correlate the mutation with the severity of the symptoms of a particular patient. This can be done only if you sequenced via uh, from different patients. And this has yet not begun to appear. Even in India, there have been lots of sequences done, but I think there is no correlation with symptoms. Infectivity seems to be, uh, you know, even a place the virus is spreading, they have sequenced samples and there's a mutation. And right now it has either aspartic acid 611 to glycine or something in the receptor binding domain which has been implicated in this. But I'm, uh, I don't think the evidence is in yet. See, we have to understand that in this kind of sequencing, it's only a short time since people have started doing this. It's mostly after about February that this work has begun. Okay. Sir, uh, there's one more question from Ms. Ashwini, who is a PhD student in Central University, Kalabarga. She wants to know what should be the focus of research in COVID right now. Is it this understanding of infection pathway of the coronavirus, or is it to understand the uh, towards uh, developing vaccines and uh, cures? Something. What is the question which has come? No, I think Where the should we concentrate. Yeah, I don't know. This is a uh, you're asking a question which is what uh, government funding is ask. <laughs> Uh, I would say that <laughs> okay. the people who can understand the mechanisms of the coronavirus and the people who can develop vaccines are two sets of people. So the question would be, should we put money there or should we put money here? <laughs> yes. So that is a very much more difficult <coughs> to, uh, to answer. Sometimes without knowing very much and without having a clear uh, idea of how a practical application will emerge. If you do the kind of development research, uh, it will probably lead to nothing. So I think one has to be very, very 
uh, cautious in this. But there's a lot of research worldwide which one can draw on in uh, moving forward. But you must be aware of the literature then completely. And okay. see, let me put it this way. I think this is true of all of us. I don't think there was anybody in India. I don't, I, maybe there were one or two people and they should then write to me saying that we heard you saying this. I don't think there's anybody in India reading about coronaviruses before January 22. And uh, if there was nobody reading about coronaviruses before January 2020, how do you expect that by September 2020 they would have solved the problem? Mm -hmm. Has any problem been solved like this in the past? Okay. So I think government also should realize the reality of things. You know, yeah, it is not that. Uh, before a COVID vaccine really comes along, the disease would, the pandemic would have run its course. There are already places where the pandemic. Thank runs. you very much for that very humorous way of putting it. Sir. I hope and, government officials do hear you. Uh. No, I think it is like this. I think it's not government officials. In fact, I think everybody should have a good understanding of biology and the importance of evolutionary understanding of biology. Viruses will come. Uh, new infections will come, they will die. And uh, we have gone through them. Uh, you can ask the question, how many deaths they had in the influenza pandemic of 1918? And uh, where are we today? We are worried because it's in the present. But uh, uh, human evolution has also taken place here. There is human cultural evolution. There is human technological evolution. Cultural evolution is technological evolution. Uh, so I think we will come out of this in 2021. Uh, the question is, do we stop doing research at that time? I think it would be inadvisable to stop doing research at that time. We should be prepared for uh, other things which will happen. I think uh, you have answered... Uh... Uh, what uh, Dr. Philip, uh, urologist, has uh, raised also. Sir. So he was actually talking about uh, uh, even though the virus was identified so long ago, why the research on vaccine is not keeping up in pace with the virus work. That is what was his uh, question. I think well, both. Uh, actually, there's a very unfortunate thing that has, I think, happened. I think you must ask epidemiologists this question, and there are some very good epidemiologists in India. You see, SARS-CoV-1 was also a very deadly virus. In the, compared to the number of people infected, if you saw my slide and I've taken it from a WHO and a BNJ article, if you, uh, the num number of people infected and the number of people dead, very high number of people who died. But the problem was that infection started in southern China, came to Hanoi, and it was quickly controlled there. There's not that much of air traffic in 2002-2003 from uh, that part of China and to other parts of the world. Uh, whereas what has happened here is, and now I think sequencing data shows this, it's possible the virus emerged in Wuhan not in December of 2019, but it might have emerged in Wuhan in August of 2019, or September of 2019. There's enormous traffic between Wuhan and Italy. Because of uh, many projects that the Chinese are doing in Northern Italy. This is why the pandemic was so severe in Northern Italy to be And then from Italy, it has spread everywhere else. And also from Wuhan. Look at the number of students who have gone from Kerala to Wuhan medical colleges. Uh, so uh, air traffic and air traffic from the places where an infection. See, the co coronavirus of 19 or COVID-19 is a rich man's disease which has been spread to poor people in India. Because the old infections came uh, from air travel. But eventually they would have come one way or the other, but maybe at a later time. If so many people are asymptomatic today, so many people would have been asymptomatic even uh, at the beginning. And you are all clinicians. 
you will know that a patient can come, be severe and die without anybody investigating why that patient died afterwards. And therefore, the first patient from whom they have taken the samples is obviously not patient one. How many asymptomatic carriers there were who know? I think this is a subject at which epidemiologists are going to discuss for a long time. And I think epidemiologists must discuss this in, together along with uh, sociologists as to how travel and all of this spreads infection. Question and uh, that elaborate answer. Uh, there are quite a few messages in the chat box uh, thanking you for the wonderful session. And a uh, few questions, I think, regarding similarities and differences between COVID-1 and 2, and I think we have covered all those areas. So uh, with this, I think uh, we would go and conclude this session. On behalf of the scientific society, Ma Ma yes, sir? Yeah. Yes, sir. You're muted. Yeah. Now, before we conclude, I have one or two things to share. And firstly, you know, I must wholeheartedly, having spent his precious time in disseminating his in-depth knowledge, study, expertise with us in a most simplified way. That's one. And uh, while introducing one last slide, I didn't speak anything on that. You know, the reason was about SIRS uh, getting recognized for the Merrifield Prize by the American Peptide Society. And that was the way most recent one in the first week of August. And uh, I'm uh, and I think it is the third is to receive a ticket for a nomination for 2021. So I take this opportunity on behalf of our AVMC and GMRF to congratulate uh, Professor Ramavishan Balram for being the first Indian to receive that uh, uh, Merrifield Prize by the American for your lifetime contributions for the peptides. You know, peptides are become a day to day for anything and everything is boiling up to that. That I wanted to uh, tell you. And I also want, I certainly do not want to uh, lose this opportunity of wishing for, on our behalf for all of you for a further uh, laurels you know, for the country. You are the one, you know, we ardently wish that you should have some more, uh, you have a capabilities. Of that, and the last, sir, I want I have want to comment on that. This uh, COVID pandemic has you know, rather destroyed, disturbed, uh, done everything, including the science. Now, because of the panic it has created, it has it has uh, uh, destroyed or devastated so many concepts. You know, in my own humble way, I'll have this evidence-based practice, and you remember you are the top of Ebola. And this, the, the, I have seen for the first time the evidence that is changing from morning to evening, hour to next hour. That kind of a things have happened here and uh, leading to, to so much confusion, not only from talking about the therapeutics, deaths, even for the researcher also, where to start, where to end. And uh, even the lot many. Well, adopted. Adopted for even the, the we see a controversy in giving the drug approval by the DCGI and the uh, Russia puts out the vaccine and the next day the chief of uh, the Russian health division resigns for short term. Such a thing, you know. So what is your comment on these such things? Right, wrong, or wrong? See, I I would say. Uh, We've never seen in anybody's lifetime uh, anything like the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And therefore, we are all new to this uh, pandemic. And I think many times we, some people have reacted in panic. Other people have reacted saying that it's nothing. It will. Uh, so even when you look at world leaders, uh, their reactions have been completely different and they would have reacted on the basis of professional advice that they got. And so the professional advice has also been widely varied. And I don't think you can blame anyone because we haven't seen anything like it before. Now, 
I would say one thing in India which we should avoid doing is right now what is happening is funding agencies are worried only about COVID. But by doing research today, you're not going to uh, get a breakthrough in getting rid of COVID-19. The virus has begun to run its course. It's been there for six months. It may be there for another six months. And uh, we should not make the mistake that we did after 2003. We didn't make the mistake, but I think the West they did. Uh, most of the coronavirus research was downplayed at that time. Only a few people who had grants continued. Someone asked the question, why was the vaccine not found? Because there was no disease to give the vaccine to. No patients. No, it wasn't going around. By the time you get a vaccine, uh, you have great problems in actual distribution. Can you imagine 1.1 billion people? The logistics of doing it, the I think we have to think. I think for policy makers and uh, others, it's time to figure out how, what should be done for it. Not. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Very engaging and interesting lecture. So you made things uh, which are uh, slightly dry and a little more complicated into something which is simple. And uh, and more than that, I think I I really like the way in which uh, you brought in the uh, history of the disease. Spoke about. Uh, And not on what is the current problem so that we would be able to uh, uh, come up with uh, solutions uh, for the future. So, with that, uh, we would like to conclude. Uh, before we go away, I have uh, announcements for the participants. Uh, you will be receiving the uh, link for the downloading. Yes, sir. And I would request uh, Professor Bunam if it is okay for him to share his slides with you. With you. So, if uh, Professor Balram is willing to share, to give us the audience, and we can uh, download it along with the certificates. And uh, the other thing is, uh, and I'm very we have Professor Toj, uh, who is the uh, chairman of the JIPMA Governing Council. Uh, he will be talking about the uh, future in future. So that is the uh, talk for this week. So we'll be meeting again next uh, Friday.